Okay, all right, let's, uh, I'll gong the meeting to order with my mysterious gong. And uh, if everybody would like to uh, stand up, we can recite the Pledge of Allegiance to officially start the meeting. I will start. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag. of the United, of the United States, States of America, America. and to the and republic, republic for which it stands, stands. One, nation. one nation, under God, under God. God. indivisible, indivisible. With liberty and liberty justice, and justice for, all. for all. all. I usually add to that all those that can afford it, because we know justice costs money. But that's not in the pledge, so I, so I probably as president should not add that in. Okay, the next uh, order of business, of course, is the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. And after a few more weeks of this, I may actually have it memorized. Okay, number, number one, is it the truth? truth. You know, I'll repeat after me. Number two, is it fair to yeah. all concerned? All concerned. Fair to all concerned. Number three, will it build goodwill better, and better, better friendships? friendships? <laughs> number four, Will it be beneficial, beneficial to all concerned? Concern. Now these are, we recite this every week. <laughs> I wonder if we really think about the words of it. First of all, I mean, you think about it, is it, it's what we're saying the truth. Now, of course it is, unless we're kind of kidding each other, but, uh, but you know, is it fair to all concerned? That's kind of a thing that you really have to think about. Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. But you want to think about those consequences. I know I've said some dumb things over my lifetime that I wish I'd never said. Anyway, but uh, hopefully uh, by the end of this year, I will have this all memorized and uh, be able to practice it better. So well, welcome everybody. I'm glad that we have so many people here for our, for our meeting. And uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> a uh, proposal uh, by Lori to uh, work on food delivery for senior citizens and other needy folks in the Tustin area. And Lori, could you kind of explain that uh, to the group and let's see if we want to participate in that. It's a program uh, through the Tustin Community Foundation. They are delivering uh, meals from uh, Friends Cafe, which is over on 17th Street in Teston, uh, to right now they're doing about 100 inbound and low income seniors. They do it on Friday afternoons. Um, they're looking to expand the amount of seniors that, uh, that qualify for this program, so it, it could be more. And they're just looking for volunteers to come and pick up the food and and deliver. Um, they're also looking for people to drop in to some of the seniors and, and just say hi, you know, like friendship calls. So I thought that if we if there were anybody that was interested, maybe we could do a, a few. Doesn't it doesn't have to be every Friday. Maybe we could do once a month or whatever it is. I just thought there's an opportunity out there uh, for us to do a service project. Well, it certainly seems like a great idea to me. It's uh, Friday afternoon, what, 4.30 to 5.30? Um, I think you pick up the food about 3 o'clock, and they said they're usually done uh, delivering by 4.30, 5 o'clock. Okay. Okay, so that, uh, you know, something that, uh, depending on your work schedule, or like the rest of us who are not working and collecting Social Security for those who are still contributing to Social Security, for which I much appreciate, uh, we could probably take off on Friday at uh, three o'clock. I know the banker's probably available because they rarely work. <laughs> okay, stop that. I'm just kidding. I shouldn't be saying that. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm certainly available Friday afternoons and I could do it. Um, I don't know about anybody else. Is anybody else available that they could do it? They just need bodies to go pick up meals and deliver them. Um, well, Richard and I can send out something and, and add to the membership and see in those that are um, interested, and then we could move from there. Does that sound all right, Richard? That was fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. And, uh, Anyway, I, I think it's a great idea. It's a good opportunity, and, and we could kind of figure out some way to get a roll call so we so they know how many of us are going to show up on a given day, 
and they can plan accordingly. Right. Uh, anyway, but I, but I think it would be interesting. I know when, when I delivered those meals for uh, Roger at Thanksgiving, when we delivered the turkeys, I absolutely could not believe how grateful the people were to receive them. And I was, I've lived in Tustin since 1969, and I, had, I saw areas of Tustin that I had never seen before uh, that were, you know, housed people that were, that were needy. So I, you know, it's, it was uh, quite eye-opening for me the first year I did it, and uh, I did it again the second year, and, and uh, quite frankly, it was rewarding. Uh, so, well, if Laurie, if Laurie will make a motion, yes, I'll yes. second it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Okay, well, I don't think we need a motion. Let's, let's uh, let Lori see what the interest level is, and then we'll go from there. We can, we can probably uh, maybe finalize this thing next week. Okay, does anyone else have any announcements or things that we need to go before we um, do before we go to our speaker? Well, I've got that, uh, the, the teaser video for the um, uh, club awards that's coming up online. Uh, on what date is it, uh, Lane? It's the 26th, I think. 26th, yeah. The 26th of September. Um, if you subscribe to the, uh, to the, uh, either the, the Rotary 5320 uh, Facebook page or subscribe to the Rotary 5320 YouTube, um, then uh, you'll automatically get a notification and it's a, it's a live event that'll be happening at that time. And I've got the little teaser video I'm going to play. It's only 45 seconds. You want to play that teaser video now? Gary, yeah. Right? Okay, yeah, sure. why don't you go ahead and do that and then we'll get to James on the uh, food program next, okay? okay. Okay. to Santa Ana. Rotary5320.org slash live, and that links to the, the places where you can do uh, the live or the subscriptions to those um, social media. Great. All right. Thank, thank you, Gary. Okay, James. Yeah, so update for the week for Show Some Love Tustin. Uh, the restaurant this week is near and dear to all of us. It's the Black Marlin downtown. So uh, most of you already know about the Black Marlin, but um, they're doing free clam chowder uh, with purchase of an entree. So I've heard their clam chowder is amazing, but uh, try that out this weekend if you guys have a free evening and don't have dinner plans. So, um, And then, oh, and then one other thing, uh, I am doing an Alzheimer's uh, walk team. So I started that. So I'm captaining a team for that. So if anybody is interested to join the team for the walk or donate or anything like that, um, just reach out to me individually and I can send you the link for that. Is that virtual or is that actually a walk? So it's it, everybody's, the, the whole theme is that everybody's walking on every street. So you just pretty much track your walk um, via your Apple watch or app or whatever. Um, so everyone's just walking individually, but it's going to be all at the same time. So in all the neighborhoods and everything around, so. Nice. Okay. So let me know. All right. Thank you, James. Is there anybody else that has any announcements? Okay. Then I'll turn it over to Richard, who will make the inter introduction for Louise Hernandez. Thanks, Fred. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce Louise Hernandez from Corazon today. Corazon has been a long excuse me, Rotary has been a longtime supporter of Corazon, which means heart in Spanish. If you've ever participated in a Corazon build, I highly recommend it. It's a long day, but the pleasure of building a home in a day for a family in a poor neighborhood is very gratifying. As, Louis, as Executive Director, Louise leads Corazon to advance the impact in poverty-stricken communities in Tijuana and Tecate. Louise has had firsthand experience breaking the barriers of poverty as a child growing up in the poorest communities in Los Angeles. 
She developed a strong sense of devotion to helping others living in poverty as she was beneficial to youth programs. This experience gave her a deep appreciation of how organizations like Corazon seek to improve the quality of life for families. Louise's career has taken her around the world. She brings over 25 years of experience across multiple industries, geographies, and scale of business. Before joining CoreZone, she was with Kaiser Permanente for 11 years. She served as a community wellness project manager for the St. Francis Medical Center, and she holds a bachelor's degree in economics from UCLA. Louise's true passion is helping others be inspired, educated, healthy, and live a long life to their fullest potential. It's no surprise that Louise also enjoys being active, cycling, hiking, surfing, and walking the dogs. And it's the active lifestyle that gives her room to be a foodie and to find new places to dine. We were sad to hear that Louise is going to be leaving her position as executive director of Corazon to return to the healthcare industry. She will remain on the Corazon board, but we will miss her as executive director. Louise, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Thank you so much. Uh, um, as he said, I'll be remaining on the board um, uh, for, um, you know, to help them and guide them through, but we also have uh, an executive director returning from, um, who was an executive for 10 years. So we have stability and, um, but thank you all for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I wonder if I can get permission to, to host and share my screen. Does that work? Yes, thank okay. you. <laughs> all right, so um, let's see. It's not allowing me to share it. Let me try it again here. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, it says all participants can share. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Let me try it again. Let's go. There, well, Are you able to? Uh, there you go. Yes, there we go. <laughs> Something got stuck. Right, uh, thank you, as I said, for having me. Um, it's been um, such a a great um, past two years, just uh, helping Corazon continue their mission. Uh, you know, they started back in um, the uh, back in the '70s, and you know, still standing firm today, uh, 42 years later. And um, so, we're out there building um, communities uh, through housing, uh, family, strengthening the family, and and our mission is ultimately to help these uh, families be more uh, self-sufficient and also for volunteers in the U.S. to, to help in that development. Um, so there's, as you know, in Mexico, there's, there's a lot of poverty and um, by the projects that we do and the community development do, we, um, we create a, a life of dignity and opportunity for the families um, and it's safer and better places to live. Uh, housing is just the beginning. Uh, it, if you have a, a good, decent roof over your home, there's going to be uh, less domestic violence, less crime, um, people finish school. So housing is just is, is kind of a, a good foundation to start. Um, this is just kind of a, a bird's eye view of, of where Corazon has been since the 70s. Uh, we had two Orange County community members um, uh, start uh, uh, working in the communities of, of uh, Tijuana and also an Orange County homemaker. So the, it was officially founded April 18, 1978. And uh, through the years, they, they had a 10 by 20 structure and then they went to a 12 by 20. And then right here in 1996, they finally um, arrived at a 16 by 20. And this is the home. We lay the foundation um, over in Mexico, the, the, our local staff. And then um, you all have seen that you arrive on a Saturday morning early and by five o'clock you're finished and this house, um, the key is handed over to the family. In addition, we found that, you know, it was not just a, 
um, a roof over their head, but we had to do other things. So we started building uh, community centers, um, running community centers where the residents could convene and start advocating for their, their own neighborhoods. And so that has worked out well because those community centers serve as a hub for meetings, assembly, community meetings, committees. And um, so it's a, it's a great infrastructure to have locally because um, we can directly impact those communities. So, okay. So um, about seven out of 10 um, Mexican um, are living in poverty or vulnerability. And with the border communities of Tijuana, they got the, even though they're so close to the US, the cost of living can be even greater than some of the communities in the rural communities down in Southern Mexico. There's a population of about 1.3 um, residents in the area and about half live on less than $200 a month. So over 40% of Mexico's population is living in poverty and it, it keeps rising the poverty levels. Um, so when we started building home in the 70s, this is what it looked like. Uh, we were doing the best we can to put over uh, shelters and, and people were living in makeshift homes. Um, and this is a home today in 2019. So it's, it's quite um, remarkable, the, the transformation. And also um, you can see the houses dotted across the, the hillside in Mexico, if you've ever gone, and they're always colorful. And as I said before, a decent home really allows the family to strengthen and gives them stability. Um, it is a well-known fact that, that kids will, are more likely to graduate from school if they have a decent home. These are the many um, kind of uh, homes that you'll see and that the residents pick the, the color of the home. Um, the, the materials uh, for the most part are all purchased in Mexico. Uh, we used to drive them across, but uh, with kind of import duties, everything is pretty much uh, done in Mexico. We, we do source our lumber mostly in the U.S. But other than that, we have uh, about uh, six staff right now that, that work full time and managing the community um, development uh, from housing to education to um, community activities. So, um, so not only do we, the, as I said, do we build homes, but we provide scholarships to youth from, um, from primary school to university level. And these are just some of the most recent phase scholarship re recipients. There's many more. We, we grant um, probably about 400 uh, per year, uh, of, and ranging anywhere from $150 for a, a primary kid to $1,500 for a college kid. The, uh, all, most of the kids go to public school. And um, so it's provided. They need money for uniforms, for books, supplies, transportation, um, and for, for lunch. So that um, financial assistance really helps them achieve, um, you know, their continuing to school. Now, the great thing is that the primary education, 90% of the population complete um, primary education. And, and these are statistics that I got directly from the 2015 cent cent census. Um, you can see 2015, 96% of the, the boys and women and children, boys and girls completed primary school. But then as you advance into high school, uh, it's 44%, 40% of the high school uh, completion. And that's because of the poverty. So kids quit school to go and work and help their family out. And this is, you know, this is not a good number if, if, if a country is to be able to advance and people are able to get more economically stable. So as you can see here, the numbers dramatically shift um, to that 44%. And it's probably, it may be, the numbers are improving a bit, but it's very, very slow. Um, here's one, one student um, that started with Corazon. She was 10 years old when she joined our, our community programs and she applied for a Corazon scholarship. And throughout her, um, her youth, and into college, she received financial assistance. And today at 24 years old, she's a civil law attorney. And she, you can see her in a blue shirt. Blue shirt is part of the team that goes out and builds homes. She's a seasoned uh, 
builder out there and you can see her hamming on the roof on, on the weekends. Marisol is very dedicated to the community and is giving back. Um, that's one of the requirements also that not only do, do we bring volunteers out there, but in order to be a recipient of these services, they have to put in 15 volunteer hours per month and they have to do it over six months. They apply for any of the programs through their community centers and uh, then the committee approves them and then they are um, put on a list for homes. Of course, we, we build about 40 homes on average a year and so not everybody receives a home right away. The other uh, challenge is that land is expensive. So um, the other, the third component, so we build homes, we advance education and empower communities. So we've developed leadership development programs where the community members get training on how to um, run their committees in their, their community centers. And through that, they set up goals and they take on projects for what they wanna advocate in their neighborhoods. And this is just a group of women uh, um, going through training, leadership training, and they're teaching them. So if you attend one of their meetings, they're very organized. They, um, even though, you know, it's like this, it's a, it's a uh, this is an actual mm -hmm. conference room that we rented, but um, in their community center, it might be outdoors. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, uh, you know, slick conference rooms or anything like that, but they get the job done. And so if they have a, a, a goal of maybe advocating for better roads or lighting or playgrounds in their communities, this is where they convene to, to work towards those goals. And they also have tutoring um, centers. So I will mention that we were recipient of um, a Rotary International Grant in 2017, and this helped um, really take our programs to another level. It funded more uh, leadership development, tutor training, uh, entrepreneur programs. So uh, we just closed that, did that final close a grant, but now we have to maintain and sustain. So we are in the process of reporting all those metrics to Rotary every six months or so. And even in this time that we're, um, we're working in Tijuana and Tecate, we're, we're still able, uh, we have an, in, this infrastructure allows us to do um, the virtual communication. Um, there, there have very small amount of people um, in the community centers right now, mostly to do maintenance and small meetings, but our staff has been able to reach out to them uh, through their, mostly their cell phones <laughs> and through WhatsApp. So we send out uh, communication and now the, with the virtual, um, we recently purchased uh, tablets and internet service each of these community centers, we purchase internet service that they can um, have access. Rotary also, uh, through the grant, purchase computers, laptops, where there's uh, centers where they can come, although right now it's limited. So in the meantime, we're doing, um, we're helping the kids. Like the U.S., many of the kids are, are challenged by uh, downloading their homework and and under, you know, the parents being able to help them with their homework. It's, it's tough times for everybody, but especially in these communities because they don't have internet, they don't have equipment. So we recently did a campaign and now um, we've provided uh, financial assistance to those families that lost their job for over 50 families that were really um, in, in deep financial uh, hardship, as well as for the children. They, the, um, mostly the primary and secondary kids. The, the high school and college kids, they're kind of well established in, in their routine. And so the families needed help. Some of the younger families needed help. So the tablets are there so they can do their homework and um, um, interact online with their teachers. So um, two of the communities are in Tecate, which is rural. And then the other four are in Tijuana. Sorry about that phone ringing. <laughs> so as I said, the, the community centers um, have the assemblies and committees. For working mothers, they have the daycare centers. Uh, they do workshop, tutor training, and then special events, summer camp, soccer camp, and of course, ongoing leadership development.
So there's, uh, there's enough there to, to really support the communities. And um, it gives us the opportunity also, we go in, um, we have one of our community coordinators who attends the community um, meetings and helps them and we provide guidance in whatever they, they need. So after 42 years, we, we continue to have a commitment. Even during these tough times, there's, there's just no moving corazón out of, out of Tijuana. We're, we're, um, we're there to stay and we have such a dedicated board who, who has really, um, the bulk of the, the members of the board have been with the organization 25 plus years. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, uh, um, a group of um, volunteers and members of the, of, of the, the U.S. community that are very committed to the mission. So, um, and Rotary has been a big part of, uh, of that. And we're, we're very grateful to all the um, different uh, Rotary clubs who have been out on builds and supported us through this, through the years. And then Les. <laughs> and I don't know if any of you have ever been to Africa and battled mosquitoes, but um, about two years ago, I was in Uganda. Uh, this quote kind of really hit home. I was out there uh, working with a health center trying to improve their operations and I would battle a, a little mosquito at night. And I was like, you know, if that mosquito can make a difference, we all can too. <laughs> it's just one, one volunteer, one sponsor at a time. And um, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to be here um, today and I'll open it up for any questions. Hi, Louise, I have a question for you. Uh, John, uh, I talked to John Perry earlier in the week and uh, he wasn't able to join, but John Perry from Yorba Linda has been uh, uh, one of the coordinators for the last few years for, uh, for our visits down to, uh, to Mexico. And he explained a little bit about how the decision is made of who gets a house, who doesn't get a house, and what you have to do to enable yourself to have a have a build if you could talk a little bit about that okay so as i said um 15 volunteer hours per person um when they apply so if a family um decides they need well first first the first hurdle is acquiring the land so and this is getting more difficult because the land prices on these border communities is great so if they've managed to um acquire a piece of land and often they will finance it. So they'll purchase the land and they'll, they'll finance it like we finance a home or they've been on the property and, and um, kind of have squatting rights and they have to show title to the property. So that's the first hurdle. And we also have to go out and, and look at the property and see if it's an, a location we can build. Um, they'll submit their application once they've, uh, completed those hours, six months minimally of 15 hours a month. And then that makes them eligible. And then they're, they're qualified, the committees the, of each community center, uh, submit them to the greater, to all six communities where they are vetted through there. So they try to divide as much as possible where the greatest need at, in the communities and also give equal um, distribution of the homes. Um, so of those six. Now the Communities that we're seeing the greatest need is Tecate and um, the Valle de las Palmas and Cerro Azul. These are rural communities that don't have um, a sewer system. In, Mex in Tijuana, we don't generally have to put in the septic tank. So now when we're doing house builds there, it doesn't make sense to build a house with a bathroom with if you don't have proper, you know, uh, you know, processing of the waste through the septic tank. So that goes along with it now. And so John has been so instrumental in really training the staff on the ground um, with his team. And we're now at a point where he's ready to kind of hand over that. And this kind of virtual environment is, is kind of forcing us to do that. So we're in the process of him doing virtual guidance on, you know, while we're on the ground in Tecate. So um, we'll probably be installing those septic tanks, although we prefer to have them, all the volunteers, the US and, and Mexican volunteers working side by side, 
um, in this environment because we're kind of at a standstill in, in construction with the border, um, you know, being closed uh, for the most part, uh, unless it's essential business. Um, and I'm, did I answer most of that? Sure. Okay. Yeah. We've got Harish has, has raised his hand, and then after that, uh, they can help. Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Gary. Um, hi, Luis. This is Harish. I'm with the Rotary Club of Irvine, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm a guest here at this club, but um, I've been to a few builds, uh, but I was not aware of all of the other work that's going on with Corazon, and I'm curious to know about that uh, uh, Rotary International grant that you got, was that a global grant? And if so, which district and which clubs did you collaborate with? Is that something that's an ongoing project? And if there are any new opportunities that might come up in the next year? Yes, that is a global grant through Chicago. The, the um, program office, is it Chicago? Yes, I, I believe. Yes. Um, and that is um, uh, Jean Hernandez. It, I forget the district number. <laughs> I know there's a lot of 53. <laughs> I should know this, but it's a uh, 53. He's us. Yeah. Okay. Look at Lane's name, District 5320. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No but um, no, we talk no. almost every week, and, and you think I would remember the district number. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, that was a long process. The writing the grant and then submitting it, it, it was a, but once it got approved, um, you know, I think the challenge was with some of the grants and from my perspective of working in the nonprofit world is uh, the, the time uh, that we were given to, to use the grant. It was, it was like one year um, and it was a sizable grant. Um, so we had to really push all these programs very, very, um, we did a, had to fast track the program. So we brought in um, trainers for the leadership development, for the tutor training, the entrepreneur program. It had many moving parts. Um, my predecessor um, basically wrote those grants. And so I've been in the process of, I've managed the ongoing reporting of the grants. So that's why I know them uh, fairly well. But um, yes, I mean, this helped really push our communities to another level. It, it, it is, especially the education, having greater training for our youth to be able to help the younger kids, as well as the leaders of the community. Um, the entrepreneur program, that, that was probably the one that was a little bit more challenging. And um, what, I've, what I've, at my ask for future grants is for the grants to be smaller amount and then to bite off just um, a project at a time because uh, there's, there's a lot of reporting and we want to be able to, to follow the metrics and evaluate the programs as well as possible. But that's, that's my own learning from it is that um, certainly it's great. This particular grant was 200,000 and uh, it was so generous. Um, but from, from if I would um, advise and if you did any global grants to maybe make them um, more focus on one project at a time. That way we're able to um, maintain and sustain. So. Hello, Dick. Um, I, is it Anaheim that is writing the grant, the global grant, and who is the host grant in Mexico? So we have, club, in Mexico, we have another Rotary Club. We yes. have a, so the money, the money comes from the Rotary in the U.S. And then it's, it's put in the hands of the local Rotary Club, Club Millennial in, um, in Tijuana. And there's a team of um, local Mexican uh, business people. Um, I've been to their meetings. One of the leaders um, helps facilitate that. And they do the disbursement. So not only, they don't disperse it directly to us, and then all of our, the tracking and the invoices, everything has gone through the, the local office, the local club there. It's so it's a part of the It's Yorba Linda where Gina Hernandez is the member. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's Yorba Linda. I'm familiar with these grants 
through the Guatemala Literacy Project. And we've been involved for a long time. And I was down to Corazon. It's a wonderful project. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'll get smaller grants because Rotary International went through about 10 years of reviewing mm -hmm. grants and how to set them up. And they encourage cooperation with a group like Corazon and a sponsored group like Your Belinda for larger grants. So the paperwork is enormous. I know, yes. No, I know. <laughs> I've had the follow-up, yes. yes. But, you know, I think for, um, you know, the paperwork is, is something that we as, um, you know, leaders are used to because if you're going to be um, – stewards of, of Rotary's money, we have to be able to give you the, the feedback and the evaluation and the monitoring of the program. So although it's a, it's a big uh, task, I, I think, you know, it's a win-win for everybody. You want to see what your return on investment is. And of course, we have to do the work on the ground, on the front lines to make sure that these programs get delivered properly. Um, and I've worked in other grants yeah, I, I, I wish they would be more flexible on the quantity and, you know, just the amount. Because in Mexico, that dollar amount is pretty large. And so um, to spend it in a year is, is, is really tough on the local staff to try to kind of execute that. And you want to, as I said, be good stewards of the funds. And that's my own feedback as, um, as a director. Granted, you know, we love having the, the commitment, the financial commitment, but it is also a, a huge responsibility to manage that, that large of a grant for a small organization. And I'm, like I said, I'm not trying to discourage that, but I'm being transparent about from a grant management standpoint and also just the use of the funds. It, it's a lot of, um, especially in, in these local economies, um, 200,000 goes a long way um, in, you know, Mexican communities. So, yeah, because the local, the local cost of living, um, the food, all of the supplies, all of that is, is much cheaper than U.S. costs. So I, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts about that. Well, uh, uh, we've been working in Guatemala over 25 years okay. with these grants. So maybe offline we could talk. Okay, all right. <laughs> and and get uh, with Rotary International, the minimum international or matching grant now, global grant, is $30,000. Okay. So, uh, is that something you might talk with the Rotary clubs that are you know, writing the grant yeah. and suggest from your perspective, a, a thirty or $40,000 grant would be much more manageable uh, and more focused the way you want it. Yes, and, and like I said, you wanna you wanna do the right thing. And so so yeah, oh thank you for that. Because as I said, I was not on the ground uh, writing the grant when it was submitted, but that that was probably my own experience with it. Um, just because like I said in the foreign countries, you know, the money um, definitely goes a lot, you know, we can stretch it a lot more. And I guess some of the grants I've had, I've had to budget very tightly on, on funds um, over several years. Um, but the good part I like, the one thing that I really like about the, the Rotary grants is the accountability for the sustainment and, and maintaining. Most grants do not do that. And I think that is essential um, to require you know, continued reporting um, normally you get a grant and for the most part you finish the grant and you report on it. But I think this has a more longer term um, outlook, you know, perspective. Lane, did you have a question? Yeah, um, well, just a comment. As was mentioned, um, Anaheim and Irvine both are part of Corazon every year. We go down and build a home. My question was, uh, and even though if, if Gene Hernandez from the Rotary Club of uh, Yorba Linda is writing the grant. We're all submitting money to make that happen through the multiple clubs that participate in the house builds. My question is how many house builds are typical during a year and is there a maximum? 
if someone sets one up? No, um, we will do probably, we've pushed as far as 60 homes a year, but uh, 40 is the average number of homes we do. So we do about 25 in the, the spring, uh, winter, spring. We start usually building in February and go all the way till June. And then we resume building. It's too hot um, over the summer. It's a long day, as you know. And so then we resume building in September and we go all the way through um, just the beginning of November. And so that allows us to do, um, it, we could do with more staff, um, but generally the, the staff is working uh, back to back weekends for like three weeks in a row. So um, we could shore up staff and build a lot more and have kind of seasonal staffing for the house builds if they're- Those are all in Mexico, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And James, you got a Any more questions? James? James? You're muted. How much there you does go. it cost to build one house? So a house with a, a bath is 10500 So, and um, that um, will pretty much include a cement slab foundation. We, we kind of, uh, as much as possible, we get the property ready, the, the family gets the property ready for us to basically uh, lay the, the foundation. And that's done a week or two before. And, um, and then all the, the lumber is purchased here. We just found that the lumber is a better quality and consistent quality, but the rest of the materials is all, are all purchased in, in Mexico. And we have, um, we have a couple, um, U.S. suppliers, and then the rest are all local um, uh, suppliers in, in Mexico. That including the, um, the, um, the toilet going into a spa brain space, on what you call it, when the water... Septic system. That's septic system. Septic. The cost to the build. Yeah, the, the septic system, that's only in... Uh, Tecate and Las Palmas, uh, Valle Las Palmas. That that is a. Uh, we were in the past just building the home, the the bathroom. We don't install a whole toilet and everything. We just provide the 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 little bathroom space. Um, but in Tecate, the the septic tank goes in ahead of time before the build as well. So it's a. Uh, How much does that add to the construction cost? That on the um, the septic. Uh, we just changed our prices in uh, a couple months ago, but the septic system, you know, I'd have to, I'd have to um, look up the exact price of the septic system. I should know this, but it's been a while. Um, as I said, um, it's, it's, it's roughly about $3,000. Um, okay, so so we, what we include in that is, you know, whenever you build a home, we have, we have the, there's a percentage of those funds obviously used um, for op uh, administration to manage the projects. And then 600 of every project gets, um, goes to scholarships. So, um, so yeah, the, the, we, we automatically parse out $600 um, dollars per, per build for a scholarship program. Mm -hmm. Harish, mm -hmm. you have a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, you need to unmute. Yes, I did. Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I just had a clarification on other than Rotary, who are some of your big donors that contribute to your projects, uh, both either cash or in-kind contributions? So the most of it is uh, individual. We have some uh, foundations, but it's primarily private, private donations. So um, through Southern California and parts of Northern California, a lot of the different um, uh, faith-based organizations, we have a good amount of faith-based organizations from the, the, the Catholic, the Latter-day Saints, um, um, even Google has shown up to, um, to build um, Campbell Hall, which is an Episcopal school, so high schools. We did in the past do more high schools, um, but that has, now we mostly do the private schools. Um, I guess the archdiocese, you know, kind of limited what what they could do with the youth 
um, in Mexico. But we're all insured. All of our, we, we have a, a pretty uh, sizable insurance fund that we keep for when our, when our volunteers go down, they, they go almost with the coverage of, of like an employee. It's like covering employees. So we, we make sure that, um, that if there's any uh, issues. But from what I've been told over the 42 years, um, I think there might have been someone that hurt a finger. Um, that's how, how blessed we are. <laughs> we have had very you know, minimal um, accidents or, or challenges. You know, I don't, for, for all of the logistics of getting down there, um, as I said, we've, we've been watched over very nicely. <laughs> Our organization is very, very blessed. I, I must say. Um, let's see, did I answer all your question? If it came mm -hmm. Okay, there are more questions? Just one last thing. Maybe it's not uh, directly related to Corazon, but is the, is the basic education system in, in Mexico, is, is, it, uh, is it paid for by the government and does it go through high school or is it, is it just elementary school that's paid for by the government? Um, well, now it's mandatory through high school. It, okay. it has been, um, it was at just one point, primary, secondary, but now it goes through high school. It's mandatory. Now, whether they stay in school is not, you know, if it's not, the family is suffering economically, then there, like I said, there is a high dropout rate. And in our communities, what we're doing is um, for the primary and secondary, the government allows us to go in and, and look at the grades of the children. And so we track the grades. When every child applies for a scholarship, they need to show proof of enrollment and they need to show the grades. And so um, oftentimes if, they're, if, if they don't have their grades, they give us a, their ID number and it's a, a website open. You know, it's kind of interesting, but I had a group of interns uh, this past semester, collect all the grades for all the primary and secondary kids. Now the high school and college kids, we have to ask them directly for the grades. And we've been kind of tracking the, the performance. In the two rural communities, we see much lower grades. Um, our two longest standing communities, um, the, the grades are on a scale of one to 10, they're up in averaging nine. And then the communities, the rural communities, they're on the low scale. It's like a C average, just because I think economically there's more hardship. So, um, but I think, you know, we're definitely graduating above the, the you know, the 40%, most definitely. I would say, I would, you know, say it would probably be more like 80%. Our, our, our families are very uh, engaged in, in completing their education. Now we're seeing a little bit of drop off um, during these times, and it kind of has, you know, disappointed us that some of the kids say, you know, they're not, they're stopping school for now, um, and they're going to work for their families, and they'll resume at another time. So that that, you know, these are hard times. Okay. All right. Are there any more questions? We still have a few more minutes. If anybody's got any questions? I have a couple of announcements uh, at the end of the meeting, but. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand or speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. It's oh, been a really? pleasure being here and I look forward to working with you. And um, thank you so much. Thanks, oh, great. Louise. Okay. I would I apologize for not introducing our guests sooner, but I'd like to uh, welcome Lane, who manages to come to most of our meetings, and also Harish. Uh, thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. I'm sorry I didn't uh, acknowledge you at the beginning of the meeting, but I'm new at this and I'm still trying to get my feet wet as to how I'm, how I'm doing everything. Um, I'd also like to uh, give some special thanks to four of our members who have uh, consistently provided us with great support during these times. Uh, Gary Heath, who is our technical expert and sets up our meetings and sends out the notices every single week. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, Richard Rubin, who's set up our speakers. Um, he just left. Anyway. Uh, no, I'm still here. Oh, you are? Good. Oh, you moved. <laughs> yeah, I have some announcements, too, when you're done. 
Anyway, thank, thank you very me. much, Richard. I appreciate you you coming up with some speakers at the last minute. We've got three or four speakers lined up. I think we've got all of September taken care of, and I, I really appreciate that. Uh, James Haas, thank you for setting up your uh, your program for to assist uh, our uh, hold on, that's going to go away. Uh, setting up our our program for the uh, uh, Tustin uh, uh, restaurants. And also Lori for consistently providing us ideas and things that we can we can do and, and improve on. And I, I think this uh, program to uh, deliver meals to seniors is superb. So I we, we're not a Rotary Club unless everybody gets up and participates. And uh, these are the four people I'd like to thank this week who've uh, stepped up and and uh, uh, gone above and beyond the. Uh, Anyway, it's, it's great. It, I really appreciate it. Without, without this, uh, you know. Okay, uh, anything else? Uh, somebody, Richard Rubin, you had a, an announcement. I did. I want to uh, whet your appetites for some upcoming programs. Okay. Uh, yes. So uh, locally, we're going to be uh, bringing in people from uh, working wardrobes. A very interesting uh, uh and well-known organization, American Red Cross will be presenting. Nice. And uh, we will be having people from the Museum of Neon Art that's in Glendale. Uh, if you've never been there, it's a pretty cool place. And uh, from Phoenix, we'll have a presenter from the Musical Instrument Museum. If you've never been there, it's a wonderful uh, museum. So uh, that's what's coming up and uh, Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. We're not having them. They do not have a public program. Well, thank you very much, Richard, for, for setting this up. And, and anybody who, uh, if you have friends that uh, would be interested in any of these things, please tell them to join in. We've got, we've got plenty of room. We've got the entire inner tube to, uh, to collect people in this little, little things on your screen get smaller and smaller but you know it's not that big a deal so i invite anybody lane did you have something i'm yeah, sorry just what? quickly a clarification i just uh googled our district calendar and it is on thursday the 24th at five o'clock it is not on saturday night it is thursday night the 24th when we have the club awards so you can go there to the district calendar at uh, rotary5320.org and register for that event if you would like to be a part of the awards ceremony, especially Dick and Helen, who were your presidents last year, Fred, who is now, Gary, the people who were involved last year, who may want to come in for the club awards. Great. Well, thank you, Lane. Okay, anything else before I gong the bell and let everybody go? Okay, consider the bell gonged and uh, you can all go eat your lunch or whatever and I hope you enjoyed the lunch we provided and uh, we'll see you next week. Same time, same station. Thanks, Fred. It was Thank delicious. You. Excellent program. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.